what manner of slave are you? It's an interesting question when viewed from a biblical standpoint, because nowhere does the scripture speak of freedom along the lines of the way the modern world conceives of freedom. Redemption itself means to be purchased back from slavery, but being purchased from the power of sin, death, and the devil means we are now owned completely by the Lord Jesus Christ and by his church. The question is, to whom do we belong and what manner of slave are we? Now, in the wisdom of Sirach, written shortly after the time of Solomon, it deals with this question, but in a different way. It deals with it from a standpoint of today's, today's ruler and being tomorrow's corpse, that a magistrate will be like those under him and vice versa, that a ruler will be like those under him and vice versa. You see, what it's actually saying is that is the way that the Lord has charted the universe, everybody's a slave. Everybody belongs to something. Everyone belongs to a set of rules. Everyone belongs to a set of commandments. Everybody's obedience is what is called for. A king that rules a nation, especially in the ancient context, may rule a nation seemingly unchecked. But the Lord God demands of this king, of this ruler, an accounting for how they rule, how they judge, and how they govern, knowing that they will face the judgment on the judgment day. They are bound by the Lord to a whole series of rules involving how to be a king, how to be a good king, how one ought to regard himself as a king under the Lord, and how one ought to regard his subjects as a king in view of the Lord which is absolutely not different at any level of society then or now. The pauper and the king are absolutely equal. The ditch digger and the ruler of the country are absolutely the same. In each context, there are rules. There are rules for obedience. There are rules for what we call vocation. If you're a ditch digger, then you are called upon by the Lord to be the best ditch digger you can be, to take pride in your work, to be diligent in it, to be obedient, to use what you earn to care for your family, your loved ones, your vocation as father or husband or as wife or as child. All these things have attached to them rules and regulations. The modern conception of freedom as libertine behavior or licentiousness is absolutely unknown in the Lord's kingdom. The way that God has charted it out, we are all slaves. We are servants. We are called to obedience, but the context is always shifting. Whether we are a slave as the world defines slave, as one that is owned by another outright, or whether we work for them, or we're the king and we seemingly are owned by nobody, the Lord is still the ultimate owner. And the question is, to whom do we belong? And we reflect that by the things that we do. This is why in the parable there are different kinds of soil, because we as sinners are all in different states of obedience. How receptive we are to the word of God is adjusted in the parable by what level of stiffness, stubbornness, thickness, blockheadedness we have in this world. But then this is the day that the church remembers Philemon and Onesimus, an epistle that is so short we get the entire thing for our reading. Why is something this short in the Bible? There's a few books that are actually shorter. You, the last two epistles of John and Jude, I, I'd have to count the verses actually, but the race is on for what is the shortest of all the scriptures. Of all the letters that Paul wrote, why should this clearly personal letter, personally written to a fellow pastor who had been raised up by Paul, over this one incident be counted as scripture? I mean, obviously, one reason is we know that Paul wrote it. Authorship was a big deal for determining what was scripture. But beyond that, what could possibly be so critical? It's probably the most direct, personal, look at how the institutions of slavery, freedom, and the call to obedience are played out within Christendom, beginning with the early church. 
So the story that we, we are able to put together about Onesimus is that he had fled from his master. He was a slave. He was owned by Philemon. He flees and runs away. There's an implication that he might have stolen some things on his way out. Not an uncommon practice because you need money to get by or to travel anywhere. So he steals some things that he needs for money and runs away because he wants his freedom. This is pivotal. Paul tells him to go back. He flees from his slavery at a time when he is not a Christian. And then he meets Paul and he becomes a Christian. He is not just forgiven the sins he's committed. He's not just told you're absolved from, for running away from your master. No, like any other offense, whether it be murder or theft or anything else you confess in confession, the clergy would rightly tell you, you need to turn yourself in as part of your repentance. He is not just allowed by Paul to keep his freedom. He's told that if you are going to be a Christian and you're going to walk this path, you go back. Go back and be the slave to your master. Of course, a couple other things have happened. We learn that Onesimus has been studying and learning the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's been helping out Paul in his captivity, probably being a gopher, fetching him things and bringing him stuff that he needs. But there does seem to be the implication that he's a good student of theology. Onesimus is potentially a pastoral candidate down the road. But we have this problem. He's somebody's slave. In the early church, even after Christianity was legalized, that was a barrier. You would not be made clergy if you were actually the slave of someone else. Everything you did in your life required the permission of that person, and it just wasn't a suitable sort of status. So Paul has great ambitions for Onesimus to raise him up, to be educated in the faith, to be clergy, to be living, preaching, and teaching this Christian faith. But none of that can happen until you clean up the wreckage of the past. Paul actually says, if he owes you anything, I will pay it back. And he sends him back, sends him back to his master to ask forgiveness for having run away. Of course, the rest of the text is clearly indicating Paul really hopes that Philemon will give Onesimus his freedom. He's really intending. I mean, Paul goes so far as this is the closest Paul gets to being giving a gentle recommendation when he says, by the way, I could command this, but I wouldn't do that. Not to mention you owe me your whole self, but we won't talk about that. The, so clever the way he works it in there. The implication is clear what he wants to happen and suggests happen. But all of this is important. It's important and relevant because Paul does not command it and he does not, does not allow the slave to take his freedom illegally. To just run away is stealing from his master, even if he hadn't stolen any money on the way out because a slave is extremely valuable. A useful one is doubly valuable, and for your slave to run off like that means you are out a great deal of investment. I will pay anything he has taken, or whatever he might owe you. Paul is offering to do something to compensate the loss. They are struggling here to figure out a way for Onesimus to get his freedom that is ethical, that is moral, that is within the confines of the Christian gospel. Paul doesn't command it, nor does he commend his activity in running away. This has to be rectified because, in order for anything to go forward. So the epistle gives us a powerful indication about how slavery was looked at, how it was dealt with, how Paul dealt with pastors on this level of what the clergy ought to be doing ethically and morally, all within the confines of moral law. There's a ton of stuff in here, but also the diligence of Paul in requiring amendment of life as part of absolution. You cannot rob from your place of employment and then come and get absolved and pretend it never happened. If you've still got the stuff, if you're still living, you need to go back and admit what you've done. There must be confession in a legal sense as well, or at least directly to the person wronged and make it right. 
Absolution is not cheap grace. You don't get away with this stuff just because you've asked for forgiveness. Anything that can be made right needs to be made right. And so fixing this is necessary for Onesimus to go forward. The best part of this story, honestly, is not even in the epistle, because the best part of the story comes down to us from church historians. During this phase of the persecution of the church ongoing, there's a lot of records that get missed, but we do find out that down the road, when Philemon is no longer pastor of the congregation, he is replaced by a bishop named Onesimus, which could hardly be escaped that this has got to be the guy, having been granted his freedom, being called, being ordained, being installed into the ministry, being the preacher of the gospel that Paul believed he could be, but everything done correctly. This is our calling in the world, especially in a world where cheap grace is offered all the time. Well, because Jesus loves everybody, therefore everything is okay and nothing matters. Jesus loves everybody, so you're just being judgy when you talk about sin and guilt and weird perversions and whatever else is going on in society. Jesus invites all, but Jesus does not give cheap grace. He tells everyone, go and sin no more. The woman taken in adultery, the woman at the well, you name it. Jesus always says, yes, all are welcome to be forgiven, to change their life, repair their relationships, fix the things they've done that can be fixed, to be washed and absolved, to be made whole, but to live whole, to go from being a slave of Satan, of our flesh and of the darkness of the world, to being a slave of Jesus Christ. Only in our complete servitude to him can we be removed from our servitude to the world. We will be obedient to something, if it is not to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will be obedient to our flesh or to the world. We're gonna, we who cringe at the idea of slavery in modern times gladly will end up being slaves to substances and wealth and sex and anything else in the world. How hard it is to come into the church and say, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Me and Onesimus and Philemon and Paul and all who are washed here in this font and absolved and redeemed, what it is to be redeemed in Christ, being purchased back from our sin and from the world, is to become the slave of Jesus, set free from all of that nonsense out there, to be obedient to the good, healthy, wonderful things that he commands and expects of us. Not as the world judges, but as Christ judges, making all those things right as we are called to be washed and cleansed in this absolution in Jesus' name. Amen.